understand how we can ultimately dismantle any of it if we don't stick to a to a you know intensely radical politics. You're not broke if you're taxing rich people. We break production for profit and we replace it by production for need. This event is brought to you by Haymarket Books. Now more than ever, it is critical to support independent publishers, independent bookstores, and independent voices. There are two ways you can do this today. First, by buying books from Haymarket at haymarketbooks.org. And secondly, by joining the Haymarket Book Club. The following event will be recorded and shared afterwards on the Haymarket Books YouTube channel. Please subscribe to the channel, like this video now, and share it with as many people as possible. If you like this event, be sure to catch these upcoming events in Haymarket's live stream series. You can register for these upcoming events on the Haymarket Books Eventbrite page. If you miss an event, you can listen to the recording afterward by subscribing to our podcast, Haymarket Live, wherever you get your podcasts. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. We are moderating the chat, but we cannot guarantee that everyone will observe our community guidelines. People who violate these guidelines will have their comments deleted as quickly as we are able. This event will have live closed captions. Instructions for accessing the captions will be posted in the chat. We should have time for Q&A. So please post your questions in the YouTube chat window, and we'll get to those later in the program. Thanks for joining us today. Our event will begin shortly. Hello and welcome to this conversation hosted by Haymarket Books. I'm Vincent Bevins, uh, a journalist and author. I've written two books, one called The Jakarta Method and one called If We Burn. But I'm excited today to be back in the role of interviewer, um, acting as a journalist. Uh, I'm very excited to be speaking with Volodymyr Ischenko about his great book, Towards the Abyss, um, which I read earlier this year um, and I had read parts of um, over the last few years. Um, so before I start asking him questions, I'll introduce him quickly. Um, Dr. Volodymyr Ishchenko is a Ukrainian sociologist currently at Freie Universität Berlin. He has published widely on contemporary Ukrainian politics, the Euromaidan revolution and the ensuing war, notably in The Guardian, Al Jazeera, New Left Review and Jacobin. And he is the author of Towards the Abyss, Ukraine from Maidan to War. So Volodymyr, uh, thank you so much for, for doing this and for, for talking with me. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for, for having me. I'm very much looking forward to this. Okay, so uh, so thank you. You know, not just for your time, but for writing this book. I mean, I think I know you know, and people that may have read my second book will probably know that your work has been influential on what I've done um, recently. Um, not only has it been in, very helpful um, in allowing me to form some of my own thoughts about not just Ukraine but other parts of the world, and we're going to get back to that. The the, the ways in which Ukraine matters more uh, uh, than uh, to just people who study that particular country. Um, and um, this, and, and it wasn't just that it helped me to understand my thinking. And I think I told you this a long time ago that I went out and did quite a lot of field work, not only in Ukraine, but in Brazil and all around the world. And I spoke to a lot of people and I tried to put together a sort of messy 
anecdotal data. And when I found your work, I, I immediately found sort of a clear analytical uh, expression of the things that I've been finding in messy form out in the world. So thank you for this book. And I, I, I do, and I, even after knowing what you had been doing for years, I really got a lot from reading it again in this new format with the new introduction. So the reason I'm doing this book is I'm, uh, I want more people to pay attention to it. And, and I'm interested in hearing what you have to say and how you could explain it. So um, I, of course, have my own sets of concerns, the things that interest me as a journalist and author. So I may come at the book from that direction in some ways. And in other ways, I may want to explain very basic things for an audience that doesn't know anything about the even the very basics of Euromaidan or um, post-Soviet Ukraine. Um, but my first question is very much related to my own concerns. Um, on page 53, um, I found that you accomplished in one sentence what I more or less spent an entire book trying to say. Um, and th that sentence is, the aspirations of the rank and file are a bad predictor of the consequences of a protest. Um, so my question is, how is that possible? How is it possible that protesters can have certain set of aspirations and ha that have very little to do with the final outcome? And how does it work? Um, can you can you explain that that uh, analysis for me? Yeah, it's kind of like a question to explain what you explained in the, in the whole book. And uh, yeah, in my, in my own works, it actually takes much more space to explain it, but let me uh, try to make it in, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so one of the claims is actually that uh, the current crisis that we are all talking about is also a crisis of revolution. It's the crisis of the capacity of subaltern classes to organize in a conscious collective action and to pursue uh, a radical transformation of the basic social, economic, and political structures. That's uh, part of what uh, will be on the left, but also beyond the left, to think about as a social revolution. So these kind of social revolutions are in crisis, and some, well, some list, the last of them, perhaps in 1979, in Nicaragua, Sandinista Revolution, or in Iran, uh, Islamic Revolution, but then uh, it's actually a big question whether we had any kind of social revolutions anymore. But we have uh, massive uprisings in many parts of the world. And according to some estimations, uh, the, actually the number of those uprisings and the number of the cases when the people who come to the streets are capable to change the government uh, has been actually growing up uh, after the end of the Cold War. Uh, but those revolutions didn't lead uh, not only to a social or even socialist transformation, but not even to the consolidation of uh, liberal democracies. Uh, many people in the world actually were seeing them, that these are democratic civic uh, revolution that are supposed to bring the government uh, more representative, uh, uh, more democratic, at least in a very narrow liberal understanding of the world. But even according to such narrow uh, view, uh, the, we would see that it's not exactly what happens. Uh, and uh, the people actually do have aspirations. So they think uh, that they actually participate in something what they understand as revolution in many parts of the world. It could be called like uh, Euromaidan revolution, or revolution of dignity in Ukraine. In other places, the revolution of Rose in Georgia, uh, the various people's power revolutions in other parts of the world. Uh, when people think about those uh, events as revolution, they do have some expectations. However, way they do expect some uh, significant change of uh, what is going to happen after they overthrow the incumbent president or the unpopular political party and so on and so forth. But those aspirations that uh, may be very diverse, may be vague, um, may be uh, well, well contested. And that's a, a big part of that. They are not translated in the uh, actual consequences. And that, that, that's a part of the problem. The uh, societies are not becoming more equal. In fact, statistically, they're actually becoming more unequal. 
the uh, crime rates go up. The state. Uh, and this is well, this is after a, a yeah, non social after, revolution. After the revolutions, and now and I'm speaking uh, about in particular about the study by Mark Basinger, an American political scientist, who actually uh, put some significant effort to uh, estimate uh, in a quantitative way the outcomes of those uh, revolutions uh, in a, on a big data set. So this is not simply speculation. This is there is some data standing behind behind those claims. So crime rates are going up. Economic growth is not going up, but it's going going down. Ethnic tensions also uh, go up, and these are actually the uh, consequences that are pretty different from what the social revolutions led to. The common criticism about the Soviet or Chinese revolution is that actually they built dictatorships strong authoritarian regimes. At the same time, they uh, brought some significant improvement in social equality. They constructed stronger states, not only in the authoritarian dimension, but also in the welfare dimension. The left wing of the state, how Bourdieu called it. Uh, and uh, the uh, crime rates, they obviously w went up, uh, immediately after the revolution, but then they are going down. The uh, corruption is also going down. So the, there were some very distant outcomes of the social revolutions that actually uh, made a legacy of how we are thinking now about the revolutions and actually also shaped the expectations that we have from participating in mass protests and revolutionary events that are not happening anymore. And the reason for that is uh, that the, the problem is not only in the aspirations, but in, in the organization, in the organization of, of the subaltern classes, in their capacity to pursue a collective uh, organized action, uh, also on the political level, also after the uh, overthrow of the government happens, to control those consequences their capacity to articulate uh, concrete uh, programs of social change and also to implement them on the social level. Their capacity to build some strong organic leadership coming from the subaltern classes. And this is what we're lacking now. And this is, well, in a brief, why the aspirations are not a predictor of the actual consequences. Yeah, and I think... So this book is a set of essays, some more personal, some more analytical, starting really with the uprising in late 2013, what becomes called the Euromaidan Revolution or the Revolution of Dignity. Um, so you've, that was a, a, a fantastic explanation of why and how aspirations are bad predictors of the consequences of a protest. Um, in 2013, in Euromaidan, what were the aspirations presented uh, at that moment in Ukrainian history? Well, uh, as, uh, these contemporary revolutions, they unite many different people and many, uh, for, coming from many different groups with different interests. And that uh, has uh, a significant uh, out, uh, impact on how those revolutions unfold and what are the consequences. But speaking about Ukraine and the different people who participated there, the first protests were started uh, mainly by the middle class people, and they uh, were seeing that the future they aspired for Ukraine in the EU uh, was kind of like stolen from them, and they uh, came to the streets. So that was kind of like the uh, ersatz modernization expectation about Ukraine. The uh, possible future Ukraine's joins the EU and, well, ideally improving the social economic situation, improving the political democracy, improving on corruption and, uh, and so on and so forth. That's what's kind of like a middle class, uh, Eastern European, uh, quite common agenda. Um, could be questioned. And I, I, I've been quite questioned it, it, uh, it a lot. And uh, ironically, the Ukrainians were waving EU flags exactly at the moment when Greeks were burning those EU flags because of the imposed austerity and uh, the debt crisis. 
and, and in a few years, uh, the the British people were voting for Brexit, and many other events were showing that the EU is actually in crisis. But the idea was that, that at least this narrow minority of the Eastern European middle class people uh, could improve their situation, and they were quite rational about that. Actually, looking at the beneficiaries of the revolution, the uh, some uh, West connected narrow middle class uh, milieu actually improved uh, their mm -hmm. economic situation, um, political influence also quite significant. But then the, uh, the first protests were repressed uh, by, by the government, although there are many, some, some conspiracy theories and speculations that uh, it was not so well straightforward, uh, the governmental repression. Anyway, the masses of people reacted to the repression of the first uh, protest camp, and then the uh, um, mobilization took, um, became became much more massive. Uh, involved um, more diverse uh, protest coalition, uh, and uh, well, the focus was uh, of the only thing basically that united all those diverse protesters was was the demand for. The incumbent president Viktor Yanukovych to go. Um, some uh, saw him as uh, well authoritarian or becoming more authoritarian uh, ruler, and, uh, and uh, well, middle class had uh, its own concerns about the uh, switch of the geopolitical orientation to the as they as, as they were afraid from the EU to Russia. Uh, there was also a nationalist interpretation, also far-right nationalist interpretation of that, uh, rooted in more like a radical and ethno-nationalist reading of the Ukrainian history that uh, uh, saw what Yanukovych was doing as a, also kind of like a betrayal of the national uh, cause. Uh, for many people also who were coming from the diverse backgrounds, also from poor backgrounds, this was also about uh, um, social grievances. Although the, that social agenda was was quite poorly articulated, and uh, because of the weakness of the social movements and labor unions, because of the weakness and the divides on the left about the uh, Euromaidan uh, revolution, and uh, the uh, so uh, we, we would see the, 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 the this, this ocean of different grievances uh, from different classes. Uh, to different extent articulated, and of course, the more privileged people had more capacity to uh, impose their agenda and to articulate it. And especially after the uh, also you know, push to push it forward, so the middle class NGOs uh, acquired a better um, capacity to push forward the new neoliberal agendas, and also quite well organized radical nationalists acquired. Uh, opportunities mm -hmm. to push forward their ethno-nationalist agendas. And also the groups of elites who quite opportunistically were switch, switching camps mm -hmm. during the revolution, and uh, some of them acquired the opportunity to uh, join the post-revolutionary government and uh, okay. solve some of their own interests. Yeah, and before we get into who wins, um, maybe we could take a step back, and this is another big question. Maybe we could try to take... Um, um, a look back at the conditions right before Maidan. So outline the conditions in Ukraine before November 2013. So again, big question. First, what had happened, you know, in um, for somebody who very, knows very little about this part of the world, what happened to Ukraine from 1991 to 2013? What happened to its political and economic system? And by 2013, who controls the state? And what are the major forces in uh, civil society? What is who... Who, what is Ukrainian civil society in 2013? Who is the state? What is um, who are these um, Western-facing NGOs that you you speak of? What is left of political parties, left formations, organized labor, and so on before this crackdown that, as you say, leads a lot of people to enter um, a protest that was initially organized by a smaller group of Western-facing uh, middle-class uh, activists. Well, what, what actually happened in the post-Soviet situation is actually a huge discussion and very much contested. And exactly in this moment, it's pretty much contested discussion uh, when the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine pushed uh, some people to start 
retrospectively reconsider the Ukrainian and Russian history, not only in the 1990s, thousands, but even before that. So when we speak about that period, there is a, the, it used to be even uh, quite popular in the 1990s, but now it, nowadays it's also quite some uh, prominence, uh, basically the end of history argument that uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, it was a brutal dictatorship, and then the Ukrainians and other representatives of other post-Soviet nations acquired the possibility to build liberal democracies and join the West. Uh, quite soon, in the 1990s, that, that narrative was contested because what was happening didn't look like liberal democracy. Uh, it didn't also look like that those countries are about to join the European Union uh, or other Euro-Atlantic Euro structures. And, uh, well, there was a different narrative. What, what we, we might actually have been seeing in the post soviet countries is the consolidation of authoritarian regimes like Putin's or Lukashenko in Belarus or Central Asian dictatorships. But Ukraine was different because the, there we had actually three revolutions in the, uh, in the life of just one generation. In 1990, the revolution for, that depend, the demanded the independence of Ukraine. Then in 2004, the revolution against, uh, again, Viktor Yanukovych, who that year tried to steal the elections. And that revolution ended without violence in a kind of like elite compromise. Uh, but then Viktor Yanukovych is actually elected once again in the elections that were considered free and fair in 2010. And gradually started to, to take some of the powers to consolidate uh, his regime. Uh, which ended in 2014, and even after that, you had even more contentious history of uh, of the war and uh, various developments. So uh, the uh, then the argument is actually what what what's happening in Ukraine was like a continuous political crisis when the uh, actually no stable political regime was capable to establish itself neither democratic nor authoritarian. And this is why we, uh, Ukraine had uh, so far six presidents in uh, 30 years history. Uh, so, and only just one president, Leonid Kuchma, was capable to be re-elected for the second term. That means the instability of, of the government. And uh, uh, politically, economically, uh, the uh, system could be described as political capitalism. The uh, big chunks of formerly Soviet state property were appropriated for pennies by a few so-called oligarchs, who could be seen as a fraction of, of capitalist class whose major competitive advantage is their selective uh, access to the state and selective benefits from the state. So the accumulation of wealth is very much connected and even more connected than in case of the Western capitalists to the specific people specific, uh, holding specific offices and allowing often informal uh, benefits, also formal uh, legal loops and so on and so forth. So this was the structure. Uh, this class of people was incapable to establish uh, any kind of uh, hegemonic leadership in our well, basic uh, left-wing Gramscian understanding of, of the world, the capacity to lead uh, subalterns, to offer them political, intellectual, and moral leadership. So basically, they were, they were seen by the overwhelming majority of the people, and this is... Uh, this evidence of after 20 and 30 years uh, after the post soviet uh, transformation, that they're still seen uh, effectively as thieves, as mafia. Mm -hmm. Those people who just appropriated what was accumulated by the whole state for their private property. Mm -hmm. And this is the manifestation of this hegemonic uh, crisis. Uh, there was, there was a uh, well, that professional middle class that I was already talking about and which played a significant role in the Euromaidan revolution, uh, partially connected to the uh, Western institutions and Western-funded NGOs 
partially also working in, uh, for example, in the outdoors industries, in particular IT, uh, whose uh, major aspiration was actually the Western integration, because mm-hmm. the Western integration w- w- would give them uh, economic and political prospects. And they didn't see themselves uh, in that uh, stagnating post-Soviet uh, swamp where they were accumulating the grievances against the oligarchs, against the uh, political structures. And also, they were quite elitist. They uh, didn't see the uh, majority of their own people as uh, something to be... But basically, they see it mainly as an obstacle. And the people who vote for some wrong guys like Yanukovych, who are passive, who are uncivic, who are, well, pro-Russian, who, are, do, not, who do not share those EU progressive values. And that, that's, again, that's not only Ukrainian, but pretty specific, well, more common Eastern European hmm. uh, scene, and maybe also going beyond Eastern Europe now. Uh, when the intellectual elite and civic elite organized in the civil society was seeing itself uh, not as a vanguard of the people to bring that people to the uh, brighter future, which was the agenda of the intellectuals in the 19th century, in the 20th century, those who were leading those social revolutions in, in our part of the world. But nowadays, they were seeing themselves as detached Detached in a, not in a, in, in a problematic way, but actually as, as, as a well, as an elite of people who are, um, for whom those uh, passive majority is actually a problem, mm-hmm. and, uh, and 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 that and then we are speaking about the working class who was uh, divided, poorly organized, with very weak unions. And uh, part of the uh, part of the working class uh, could be interested in the Western integration because, uh, well, for example, there were migrant workers in the EU, and uh, closer conditions with the between Ukraine and EU visa free regime were very mm-hmm. much essential for them. Also, they had aspirations for opening labor markets uh, in the EU. So pretty obvious things. But on the other hand, the workers who work, worked in the um, remains of the Soviet industry uh, connected via patronage links to the so-called oligarchs and uh, interested in the stability, in the stability of their wages, in the stability of their pensions, in the stability of the links, uh, great links with Russia, for which many of the, in particular, Eastern European industries were still continuing to work for, mm-hmm. uh, in part because they were not so competitive on the in the EU markets or in the international markets, but they still produce some competitive and uh, and the goods that could be sold in the post-Soviet markets. And and just to be clear, organized labor did not tend to participate in in Maidan even after the the uh, surge of support from wider sectors of society in 2013. Uh, some independent unions participated, uh, but then uh, w- what what kind of these unions are? So we are speaking about quite small uh, groups. We are ba- basically speaking ab- about participation of uh, small workers' initiatives, sometimes organized as unions formally, sometimes not even organized. And most of the workers who participated in the Euromedan revolution were becoming there as individuals not as representatives of, of any organization of any unions. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was actually a part of the problem and a part of the explanation how the Euromaidan escalated into violence because the, there was no capacity to organize a political strike. The actual ideas, and there were calls from the opposition leaders, let's have a strike, and th- that was one of the... Uh, some of the obvious things, how to overthrow a government, stop the production on all people as just stop stopping working and the government would, would could be yeah. could find find itself in a difficult situation. Uh in, in other countries it, it worked. In the post-Soviet countries, it, it typically didn't work because there was no capacity to organize the strike action. It requires organizations, it mm-hmm. requires consolidation of the of, of the workers. 
which uh, the weak post-Soviet unions uh, typically are not capable to. Yeah, and, th- and this is a, an essay of yours that is not in this book, uh, insufficiently diverse, right? About yeah. the inability to put to impose costs on political elites through the more traditional uh, or perhaps uh, desirable means like strikes and boycotts allowed for the opportunity, uh, cleared the way for um, experts in the use of violence to impose different types of costs on, on the government. Um, I want to ask you quickly before I reflect on some things you said, I want to ask you quickly, um, this in, this inability of the political capitalist class to consolidate hegemony in the 24 years since the fall of the Soviet Union. You contrast this with the actual Soviet Union, um, uh, which in your view did have exercise uh, a, a type of hegemony over, over the Soviet people, correct? Yeah, uh, uh, this is correct. And also this, this may also sound like a quite a contentious claim, right? The Soviet hegemony. And what about Stalinism? And what about those uh, great terror? And what about the famines and, well, very strong authoritarian state? Doesn't it just reject anything that we might call hegemony? Because hegemony is supposed to be kind of like uh, ruled by consent. Well, uh, there is a huge discussion uh, about that and what, uh, what specifically Gramsci meant about, uh, uh, and talk, when, when he was talking about hegemony. And uh, I, I'm on the interpretation that, uh, well, any rule actually requires both consent and uh, coercion. And even uh, um, intensification of coercion does not uh, preclude uh, forming the hegemonic relation. Hegemonic uh, relation is uh, more about the organization of the class. It's more about the developing the political uh, organization that unites the class and uh, brings it um, into the articulated uh, um, understanding of their collective interest. So this is political development of the class. And the uh, in the Soviet Union, even in the, uh, well, in the 1920s and then, and then during Stalinism, the political, uh, the Communist Party was building that hegemony. In the process of urbanization and modernization and industrialization of the Soviet societies, they uh, they actually created this massive working class for in the in the largely agrarian country, which uh, the Russian Empire was before the Soviet Revolution and, uh, and continued to be so 1920s, 1930s, and also uh, built the political organizations. Uh, bringing together those emerging Soviet citizens, uh, connecting them to the political party. Then, uh, after the Second World War, which uh, was actually the, perhaps the, uh, in, in, in the 1950s uh, and up to 1960s, this was the, the, still the upward development of that political organization and of the hegemonic relations. And what we've seen in 1960s, uh, uh, more specifically after the St- Stalin's death and in the Thaw period uh, under Khrushchev, uh, the, when the, some partial liberalization uh, started, that uh, the Soviet citizens was criticizing the problems of the Soviet society in the words of the communist ideology. Mm-hmm. So they were, well, it was not in a kind of like an imposed language for them. That was the language for them how to, to describe the reality. They, 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 they were seeing the, the, the distance between what the communist ideology was supposed to be and, and the reality okay. of the Soviet society. But they were not rejecting communism. They were trying to use, to bring the Soviet society closer. And that, 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 that was the uh, typical ideological understanding of not only the intelligentsia, but also the uh, many of the uh, working class uh, Soviet citizens. We, we know this from the emerging uh, historical studies who studied the, the diaries of the people, how the people discussed the uh, political um, 
events in the Soviet Union. How they discuss, for example, the Soviet the project of the Soviet Constitution uh, in uh, in the late uh, 1950s and the beginning of the 1960s. Uh, so the 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 the, the, the this was a manifestation of hegemony, and okay. to be fully completed, it required uh, democratization and pluralism. That was not achieved, mm -hmm. and that, that the, 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 why it was not achieved, it's also discussed in uh, multiple studies. Mm -hmm. But in, in any case, uh, that when that, that moment, well, roughly in the end of the 1960s when uh, the uh, Communist Party were not incorporating this, the 60s movement, or 60s generation, uh, but instead uh, was becoming ossified, uh, detached from the society, and also seen by many, many as, uh, well, as an emerging elite, mm -hmm. uh, detached from the interest of the uh, well, regular people. That's, that's the roots of the crisis. Of the of the communist hegemony, and that's the root of the of that crisis that uh, perhaps is still going on mm -hmm. since 1970s up up until now. Mm -hmm. Much um, a fundamental uh, uh, process that we have not yet overcome, and to which the events like Euromaidan revolution and also on the other hand the uh, consolidation of authoritarian regimes in the, in Russia and Belarus. Mm -hmm. are the uh, various uh, kind of responses to, to the same political process. Okay, I want to ask a little bit more about the crisis of Germany and crisis of representation, but I also want to mention two things that you made me think of outside of the Ukrainian context when you spoke about Maidan. This dynamic in which a small group of protesters makes some noise but does not really excite the wider population until there is a crackdown, which shocks the entire nation and leads a much larger and more diffuse, more sorry, I'm mixed to diverse and diffuse, more diverse and more diffuse group of people into the square, into the streets is one that I found to be incredibly common across the world um, in the last 10 to 15 years. I think the, the majority of the cases that I ended up looking at closely, you had this kind of a dynamic where there was a small demand that matter to some people, but not to everyone, then a, poli a crackdown, usually a crackdown on, you know, the youth or the students or a particular woman who goes viral, um, brings a much larger group into the square. I find this to be um, incredibly common. And as you say, the new arrivals may agree to some extent with the original organizers. They may come with some sets of demands that are quite different. Um, and then it becomes very difficult to understand how to get from how to transform this big ball of something into an outcome that is supposed to satisfy a large amount of people. Um, once, and then a, a little bit more personally, when I first went to Ukraine, um, as you as you, know, you referred to a, a few times um, to the NGO class or the Western, the, you know, the, the Western facing professional class, I found that when I first arrived, it was incredibly easy to meet these people and to understand their point of view because they were very eloquent and spoke English and they were very good. They knew they were, they had full-time jobs that consisted essentially of explaining this viewpoint to me. And the viewpoint, it was, there was nothing about it that I find, even now, there's nothing about it, even now knowing that there were a much wider range of views in Ukraine, there's nothing about most of what they said that I, I find to be uh, objectionable. They happen to, they often have the same kind of liberal Value, you know, if you push them in certain directions, it doesn't always go this way. But they have the same kind of um, liberal values and liberal discourse that you would hear in sort of Berlin or 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 Finland or something. Um, but it was I was struck by how good they were at it because it was it was it was really it is really a skill to interact with people like me, like an American that has a small amount of time to fly to the capital and get somebody to explain what's going on. And I was really like. You know, I've been doing, you know, I've been around for a while and I was like, wow, these people, you know, they're very, they're very good at this. And it is, it requires funding and it requires training and requires experience. Um, and it, it took, you know, and then I, you know, was lucky enough to hang around long enough to, to meet all, lots of other different types of people in Ukraine. But I mean, it, it was, it was very, um, they, they are good at articulating a particular vision of uh, two Westerners and people too from, from, to, uh, the North Atlantic. So that's just an aside. Um, I found this myself and, and I find this around, you know, in this, this 
I am in the class to which often like this, this is the same thing exists in Southeast Asia, like the, the class of people that are whose job it is to speak to Western journalists exists in Southeast Asia. They have a particular view of what news is. It's often, you know, often we end up seeing the part of the world as a, a, a as a site for the abuse of human rights rather than uh, as the site for uh, the protagonism of local peoples. But this is this is something that um, I'm I was not I'm not unfamiliar with globally, and I certainly uh, remember my first experience of, of, of this type in Ukraine. So yeah, I want to ask you ask you about the crisis of representation and the crisis of hegemony. So uh, as you've started to say, and as you say in the book, things like Maidan and Maidan certainly itself, you see as a response to the crisis of post-Soviet hegemony, the crisis of hegemony, but also to a crisis of representation, which is you see as more generalized, something which um, the post-Soviet countries experienced in a more pronounced form, but is not um, limited to the post-Soviet space. What is the difference between these two terms, if there is any po crisis of hegemony, crisis of representation? Um, and, and, and how do... Um, how do their instantiation in, in the post-Soviet space differ from other parts of the world? Uh, I, I would say that the post-Soviet countries, they uh, manifest the uh, global process in a more well, extraordinary, sharp form. Fundamentally, this is still about uh, the global a process of the incapacity of the ruling class to present their own interests as universal interests. We've seen it uh, developing since uh, what is typically called neoliberalism. And the word neoliberal hegemony has become kind of like a buzzword. Too many people are speaking about that, but it's actually questionable to which extent neoliberalism uh, was capable to build hegemony. Uh, that uh, if you think about neoliberalism, it's basically something like a pump of wealth from in the upward direction to the richest, right? And when they uh, redistribute less and less to the poorest, uh, Germany requires some material uh, conditions, right. and uh, you cannot just uh, simply uh, argue, simply claim that this is. You're becoming poor in, in your own interest. No, it doesn't work like this. Right. In fact, and or it cannot do, uh, work like this for quite a long time. The people are, yeah, they, they, sometimes they could be irrational, but typically they actually they understand uh, the black and white uh, quite well when, when it concerns their own interests. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, I would see that neoliberalism was actually the crisis of Hachim, the crisis of the uh, of that kind of capitalism which emerged in the after the Second World War and which was perhaps the most hegemonic uh, form of capitalism in the, in its whole history, uh, really connecting the interests of large sections of the working class with the uh, with, with the capitalist class. So, for, for many reasons, started by many people, it stopped. Uh, started from the 1970s, and uh, the degeneration of the Soviet Revolution was al also a part of the of that problem, as a part of those processes uh, that uh, allowed the what we now call neoliberalism to take such a global um, uh, scale. So mm -hmm. elimination of the actual threat of the of a social revolution, which the Soviet Union did represent for. Quite continuous, or quite 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 long part of its of its own history, and uh, in 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 the post-Soviet period, uh, it was also the collapse of the of that communist hegemonic apparatus on the social and political level, which left a huge void, which has not been filled by any comparable um, hegemony uh, in the. All, the, all of the decades of the post-Soviet history. And uh, in, in this sense, I, I uh, argue that uh, we have experienced the global process in a especially uh, extreme form. Mm. And th that, that pushed to some of the uh, quite extreme manifestations. 
the uh, the, the, the frequency of the revolutions in the post-Soviet space. So mm-hmm. three revolutions in Ukraine, and that's uh, in the life of one generation that speaks about quite big instability, but also uh, typical ma- ma- quite quite comparable massive protest in Moldova. A revolution mm-hmm. in Armenia, a revolution in Georgia. We may actually see another one uh, just in the end of the month after the elections in Georgia. Mm-hmm. Also, three revolutions in Kyrgyzstan. And at the same time, the uh, in other parts of the former Soviet Union, the consolidation of quite uh, extreme authoritarian regimes that we now see in, in uh, how Putin's regime uh, evolved. And ultimately, the bloodiest war on the European continent since the Second World War, which is also the uh, the outcome of the escalation of those processes that uh, have roots in the de- degeneration of the Soviet re- revolution, in the collapse of the Soviet Union, mm-hmm. and in the in the incapacity to build uh, anything stable on on its on its on its ruins. Okay. Yeah, I mean, here here you put it in a way that I think will be will make this concept a lot more real to a lot of people outside of um, the post-Soviet space. You write, um, well, this is an interview at the end of the book, um, quote, the rise of populist movements and new direct action protests, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, by the oppressed, in a sense, all are responses to the crisis of representation. All are saying, you, politicians, global elites, do not represent us. You cannot speak for us. And I think, um, as you say, this is an especially pronounced uh, um, issue in the post-Soviet space, but even in the world's advanced democracies where everything is supposed to be perfect, it's not just like a vibe. Like empirical studies find that people really believe that elites do not represent them. And uh, serious studies also find that the elites do not actually respond to um, regular people, that uh, elites even in advanced uh, capitalist economies, uh, political elites t- are far more responsive to economic interest than to the regular voter. Um, but what I want to get to next is this idea that you presented that in the post-Soviet space, the revolutions of the Maidan type not only respond to severe crises of political representation, but that their occurrence reproduces and intensifies that very crisis. So if my first question was that the aspirations of the common person in a protest is a, por- uh, a predictor of what um, the people will get afterwards. What did the people of Ukraine get after Maidan? Who won and what was the outcome? What was delivered to the people um, that had helped to make or support or believe in somehow this uh, this uprising? Well, we could, we, could, we, could, we could describe it in two uh, main uh more general processes. So first, of, uh, first one was uh, uh, actually further fragmentation of Ukraine and of Ukrainian society, which may also sound kind of like too contentious, as many people were too often speaking about Ukrainian unity. Uh, well, a war started, in, in, so it's it's yeah, you're, yeah. On, you're on solid ground there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. go on. Yeah, was, uh, all, not only to the, in, in the response to the full-scale invasion, but also in the response to the annexation of Crimea in 2014, to the start of the war in Donbass, uh, which um, uh, in, uh, which Russia played a very considerable role in uh, instigating and also uh, escalating. Uh, and uh, the claim was that Ukrainian nation become United. The the reality was actually that uh, Ukrainians were polarized. Uh, the, that, uh, the, that the claim about uh, unity was a kind of like also the something that the, that emerged in the uh, process of your Maidan revolution. We all came together to the streets, all from the different regions. The reality was that the people from some regions came to the streets in much less proportion than the people from the Western regions and from Kyiv and from some central regions, but much less from the 
eastern and southern regions of Ukraine. And that becomes kind of like aligned with also ethnicized distinctions between Ukrainian speakers and Russian speakers, with those who have more pro UN NATO orientation, those who have more pro Russian orientation. And a part of the Ukrainian society becomes uh, more alienated and, in fact, excluded from the definition of the what Ukraine is supposed to be. And also some substantial part of uh, former, uh, well, single Ukrainian polity, Ukrainians in Crimea, Ukrainians in Donbass, Ukrainian refugees who went for Russia, were simply, uh, well, excluded in very real way, not simply symbolic. So they stopped to be the um, members of the Ukrainian political uh, field. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, um, that, 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 that one sense, it's a kind of like a claim to be unified, which actually hides the increased fragmentation of the society. And we, we, we've also seen the development of the same uh, process after the full-scale invasion as well. Just think about how, how dispersed is Ukrainian, Ukra- are Ukrainians now around the world. Not only speaking about Crimea, Donbass, the newly occupied territories, the refugees in Russia, millions of refugees in the EU, the people who cannot uh, say what they believe, but st- still living in Ukraine and who are misrepresented by the public opinion service. And uh, that uh, kind of like um, very superficial unity projected also with the with the help of those uh, class of people that you described just a few minutes ago mm-hmm. uh, and the reality of the dis- dispersed fragmented nation and th- that's that's one of the ways how the crisis is reproduced and escalated mm-hmm. and another thing that uh, I also mentioned another big process uh, started by specifically by uh, the a revolution and which has uh, a lot to do specifically why it makes sense to call it revolution and why it, uh, but uh, a deficient revolution. So the, an event that has uh, revolution reform, the people come to the streets and they claim that they need to be represented and the government does not represent it. But at the same time, those people are uh, quite poorly organized. If, if the majority is poorly organized, Right, there are uh, groups in the society who organize better, who have more resources, who have more privileged classes, and these are professional middle class organized in the NGOI civil society. Speaking specifically about Ukraine, who, as as you very eloquently described, uh, as, uh, very well in projecting their own interests in, as uh, as all Ukrainian. Uh, but also acquiring uh, very uh, specific and concrete uh, political influence uh, with support of the Western powers. Mm. So, so for, just for, yeah, go on, please, please. <laughs> okay, so they 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 they, they, they could uh, say what's kind of like wrong in their belief are happening in, in the government, but they also appeal to the West in order to put some leverage on the government, mm. and. Quite often, these are the uh, leverage in order to pursue quite specific neoliberal reforms, uh, anti-corruption agenda, which is also framed in, a, rather not in a social sense, but in a quite neoliberal sense, so on and so forth. That That's one group of people. Another group of people that uh, I also mentioned, radical nationalists. Uh, who have not so good relations with the West, uh, but uh, they have uh, political organizations uh, that many other tendencies in the Ukrainian society actually do not have. Uh, the left is much worse organized and simply much weaker, uh, but even the liberals are not that well organized as, as the nationalists. The radical national. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the far right radical nationalists that uh, have been also quite, quite a, a big topic of the discussion about Ukraine. But it's also important to understand why exactly uh, they are important and how exactly they have influence. So the typical argument that those radical nationalists are so unpopular in the elections 
In the last election, they got just 2% of the votes. So what are you talking about? This is simply Russian propaganda. This is just simply some fake news and uh, nothing to talk about. And this is a complete misconception about how the politics actually worked in the country. And if if in this country you have you had three revolutions, that uh, that means that uh, we need to think about Ukrainian politics definitely not simply in the electoral parliamentarian terms. And even like the, the mainstream political science about post-social societies is precisely about how the informal influence overcomes the formal institutions mm-hmm. and how the, those oligarchs thanks to their informal connections, have so much of the influence over, over the polity. But yeah. also in, the, in, in such uh, uh, unstable, contentious politics of, of, of Ukraine, the people who have arms, who have organizations, who have the capacity to, uh, for um, armed, violent politics, they have a disproportionate influence. Yeah, on, I mean, the, uh, on, on what was happening after the Euromaidan. And thanks to the full-scale invasion, they acquire even more legitimacy, even more weapons, and uh, gaining some uh, image of uh, real heroes or elite squads mm-hmm. of the Ukrainian army, um, at least for a part of the Ukrainian population. Yeah, I mean, the fact that they have disproportionate influence is precisely... <laughs> The problem, right? The the fact that certain groups can have can represent a very small amount of Ukrainians, but yet still punch above their weight, weight yet still have power, um, gets to what is strange and troubling about the post. Um, some um, of the consequences of Maidan, right? It, if it, if it were the case that everybody, which is a everybody knows not the case, if it were the case that everyone on the in Ukraine was on the nationalist right, well, then that would be one thing, well, then they would deserve somehow to be, uh, to have some influence. But that's not the case. It's precisely the way in which certain dynamics have allowed groups to punch above their weight, um, which I think is the more coherent critique that Ukrainians make, um, which is often like, you, cuts through the two sort of loud um, narratives you hear outside of Ukraine. Um, before I read, because you sub, you summarized this in a way that I really liked, uh, and I want to ask you about before that, I want to just check with a couple factual things that I'm um, uh, remembering. I want to make sure I'm remembering correctly, and perhaps it would be helpful for the for viewers to remember. Just to check, one at its at its height of po- at the height of its popularity, Maidan was supported by about what fifty percent of Ukraine. Is that about right? Uh, what was the height? Uh, what was the, what? Uh, uh, well, according uh, according to some surveys, something like fifty percent. Uh, but also, that support uh, went down when the violence started. So that, that's the so height of its the, popularity the, the, would have the, been the, before yeah. the transition. This would have been. Yeah, the, the the last survey conducted right before the overthrow of Yanukovych showed support of something of over forty percent. Right. And so then, the violence actually decreased support for, for, for the... Right, the so at its, at its maximum, about about 50%. And, and this was not even... Uh, that survey is not taken at the moment of the transition, but but before uh, the violence. And then the other thing, you've already hinted at this, but after Maidan, to the extent that there were articulated social demands from below, those tended to be discarded, correct? Yeah, basically, they didn't become even the... Uh, any, any part of any serious agenda. So it's, uh, the, the post, post-Euromaidan uh, changes were, first, they were about uh, the, uh, well, nationalism. Well, and let, me, let me read this. Threat, me read, from Russia. Let right? me read this because I, 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 yeah. I, I wanted to ask you about the, the, the wording. So you wrote here, this is about the post-Maidan situation. Competing oligarchs exploited nationalism in order to cover the absence of revolutionary transformations after the Maidan. While those in nationalist neoliberal society were pushing for their unpopular agenda, thanks to increased leverage against the weakened state. And I not only is this a nice summary that I wanted to ask you about, but this is something that again has echoes in many other parts of the world. That it's very difficult for elites to deliver material benefits to the population or to concede often. the loss of some of their material privileges, uh, or they don't want to. It's easy 
to move in a particular discursive direction to take a more uh, a national stance or less national or, or as it is so um the idea that nationalism was something that could be done like the, you know whether it was the idea of a revolution of dignity or the the unified ukrainian people or a more just a more ukrainian ukraine this was something that could be delivered um more easily than what was either impossible to deliver or, or political elites did not want to deliver with actual material benefits and then because the state is still there, it's still the state, it's still the same set of, you know, um, institutions weakened, you say that both the nationalists and the, the Western facing neoliberal um, parts of professional civil society had simply more leverage, they were able to to play a larger role. And this is not because they're, they tripled or quadrupled or quintupled in size, it was because they, their enemies were weaker, they had more leverage, they had more you know, in, in, in some cases, they may have done, um, provided useful services, often, um, you know, physical, in physical confrontations, or they may have leverage internationally, or their, their enemies are weakened, um, which allows for certain groups to, to, um, to play a larger role than they would have before Maidan. And, and that is not about, you know, their, 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 their numbers in, in, society and as you right um there were quite a lot of people that afterwards saw the transition saw the new government um as a betrayal of who they had voted for or a, a, a direct threat to them um e either to the, their idea of a nation or even to them physically what even whether or not this was exaggerated um um by russian language media um there were quite a lot of people that saw things very differently but this is something that i've seen go this way in other parts of the world is that somebody's got to win. You got to have something you got to, you, you can't just have a, you know, people dying in the square and then you go back to you normally. There, something has to be delivered. And I think that, um, remind me of the language you use. You say that often these, these, you know, dramatic and, 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 um, very, um, if, if you support them, inspiring and heroic, important, um, confrontations in the, in the street provide sort of a well of legitimacy for a, the, the political project that is able to take advantage of them. Can you can you explain how that works? Yeah, actually, I wanted to, to intervene to that because, yeah, that's the, the first of all, the, 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 uh, in the discussion about Ukraine, it's, not, it's uh, quite often not even understood how unpopular those, some of those post-Euromedan changes have been. For example, the uh, land market reform uh, pushed forward by Zelensky and presented by him as a huge achievement because for like all the post-Soviet decades, the land market, there was actually no, no the, the land market was not legalized. Kind of like existed, but, uh, well, not, uh, not really allowed to be. And, uh, that, that 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 reform was presented as a, again as a big step in the anti-corruption and so on and so forth. But at the same time, over seventy percent of the population disapproved it because they didn't uh, well they didn't approve the the possibility for selling the land to in particular to the to the foreign citizens or for for foreign companies. Um, and the quite quite large uh, part of the political elite was also against it. Uh, but uh, the big part of the liberal NGO civil society was very much for, and that that that's uh, the the extent of the gap. Or if you're speaking about the nationalist uh, reforms, right? So the people start from the claim uh, the radical nationalists are just two percent of the votes, maybe five percent at most. But at the same time, if you look at the actual policies uh, implemented by the post Romanian government, they implemented quite a big part of the uh, radical nationalist agenda, which they had before the revolution, right? And, 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 and not the expectations about some vague social equality. Uh, the changes about the, the Russian language, the, the changes about the, the uh, ban of the Russia-affiliated Orthodox Church, uh, the changes connected to the so-called decommunization, uh, changing the names of the street named uh, the Soviet period, ban of the Communist Party. Um, and th 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 this, this point of the 
core of the problem. The uh, minority is capable to um, set the agenda of the change because they have the, le uh, the some leverage of influence. At the same time, the elites, they are also interested in delivering some change. And the easiest thing are about symbols. Let's change the names of the streets from the Soviet to, let's say, nationalist. Let's dismantle the monuments to Lenin, which were still standing in, in, in many parts of Ukraine up to 2014. Let's ban the Communist Party. Okay, the Communist Party is not... It, it was actually a, a significant party before Euromaidan, and in 2012, they got 13% of the votes in the elections. And in the 1990s, it, was, it used to be even the most popular party in the country. Uh, after Euromaidan, they lost the most important electoral strongholds in Crimea and Donbass, and they polled something like uh, 3 or 4% in 2014. So it's kind of like an easy scapegoat. No, uh, the, the people uh, are not exactly supporting the ban of the party, according to the service. Maybe, again, 30-40% supported it. But they're not going to defend it. And, and that's also the, 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 the part of the problem. A minority which, is, uh, which has leverage pushed for, pushes forward their agenda, which uh, is not exactly popular, but uh, the opposing camp is not capable to organize to stop it. Mm -hmm. And th that's how it works. It's, 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 this, it's this asymmetry of political organization, which in the current situation, benefits uh, rather privileged groups like professional middle class or better organized like in, in the case of, of Ukraine, this were uh, radical nationalists. So you, you, you mentioned Zelensky and I want to ask about Zelensky as a candidate because a lot of people that weren't following Ukraine at the time wouldn't know or remember that back in 2019, he was seen as a rebuke by some Ukrainians to this kind of uh, symbolic culture war to the to the to or into the real war in the Donbass. Um, he was attacked very vigorously by nationalists and and the supporters of the nationalist project in the English language press too. There's some quite um, funny headlines if you could look back at them of, of of people really coming at him for being insufficiently um, pro-Ukrainian, ins you know, too pro-Russian, and so on. Um, what did Zelensky run as in 2019 and how and why did he change after um, taking office? Well, when, when, when he was running in 2019, he, uh, he tried not to speak much, in fact. So he remained very vague or simply silent on many of those issues that uh, were dividing the Ukrainian politics. And the vote for Zelensky was, was kind of like a, just a sheer negation of uh, Poroshenko. And Poroshenko was seen as uh, by part of the world as an uh, old oligarch, and he was a part of the old oligarchic elite, a veteran of Ukrainian politics since the 1990s, and actually one of the founders of Viktor Yanukovych party, but very uh, well changing the camps in, at, the right, at the right time. Um, Another part of uh, the electoral Ukrainian voters, uh, they uh, saw Poroshenko as pushing forward the nationalist agenda that they didn't like. To. So Poroshenko's appeal was army language faith. Pretty uh, aggressive nationalist agenda. And in the second round, uh, the uh, eastern and southern regions voted something like 80%, 90% for Zelensky. The only regions where Poroshenko got the majority were in the far west of the country. And so uh, that was negation, right? And then... Uh, so he was, he would, would you compare him to other sort of anti-political um, candidates around the world? The, you know, you don't represent us, I'm totally outside the system, which means that I'm better than it by necessity. Uh, yeah, I, I'd say that, that there, there is a lot of comparison about that. And uh, well, uh, now perhaps the, the, the story of Zelensky is quite known, but it, it just, uh, well, even in comparison to Trump, 
for example, uh, when he won in 2016. Well, uh, tr tr Trump did have some political experience before that. He was writing books. He was participating in political shows. Zelensky was simply joking about politics up until the when, when his electoral campaign started. And uh, well, there are some theories that he was actually planning uh, to run uh, earlier and that the, his whole TV show, Servant of the People, was also designed about that. I'm not completely convinced. And, uh, well, according to the better investigations, uh, he started to think about political career not that, uh, uh, not, not very early enough. And um, so, uh, yeah, th that was uh, at least the, 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 the drive behind the voting for Zelensky was we had pretty much to do with the response to the crisis of representation. You are not representing us, and we are going to vote for some complete new buy who is uh, good looking, who, who doesn't have any major corruption scandals behind him, uh, who doesn't say uh, any too sensitive things to just to discard the, 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 the voters. And also the, the voting for Zelensky also showed the extent of this gap between the um, professional intellectual elite of Ukraine, who was indeed uh, very much anti-Zelensky in 2019 and remained uh, largely anti-Zelensky up until 2022, when he, was, he became the leader of the, of the country at war, um, and the majority of the voters. How did how did Zelensky change in that period between being elected in in early 2022? Well, he uh, largely he, he continued to pursue Poroshenko's agenda, although not not, not uh, at least until the invasion, until the full scale invasion in 2022, uh, he did not push uh, the ethno nationalist reforms, but he also did not revise them. Although quite many people actually expected him to do this, there were there were indeed the uh, uh, large scale expectations about the peace in Donbas, and in in the end of 2019, we know also that, that there was a window of opportunity to implement the Minsk Accords, and the people uh, within uh, Zelensky's team they were considering some possibility to implement it in in a certain form. It didn't happen. Uh, and not because the Minsk Accords were unpopular, but because of the asymmetry of the political capacity of the anti, so-called anti-capitulation camp and uh, the uh, well, vaguely pro-peace camp who, who, who were not capable to organize at the same time. So I mentioned the land market reform. Uh, very unpopular one, but pushed by Zelensky. In 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 the year before the full scale invasion, he intensified the attacks on uh, the oligarchs, um, the oligarchization law. He made um, enemies with uh, the richest oligarch in the country, Renat Akhmetov. Uh, he was escalating the animosity with Poroshenko. Right before the invasion, there was actually the attempts to arrest Poroshenko. Uh, and also he cracked down on the so-called pro-Russian camp, uh, on the oppositional TV channels, on the um, Viktor Medvedchuk, uh, who was a real owner of them uh, and one of the leaders of the oppositional party. Um, and so basically the, uh, Zelensky was... Uh, well, contributing to the crisis tendencies, to the destabilization, uh, the escalation of those uh, tendencies could, could have led to ever more cleavages and cracks in the political elites, potentially to um, well, more uh, massive protests. Uh, that uh, development uh, I believe was actually understood by uh, by the Kremlin, by Putin, and uh, we also know that uh, Russian intelligence conducted some public opinion service in Ukraine, 
those surveys they showed the same that uh, Ukrainian sociologists actually knew for many years that the people do not trust the government, that the people uh, uh, feel themselves alienated from most of the state institutions. And so the bad of Russians was actually that basically they exaggerated the scale of the crisis. There is some also uh, some evidence or at least some claims by the people who claim to have some inside access uh, that uh, FSB, the Russian intelligence and counterintelligence, they advised Putin just to wait for half a year before the start of the invasion and to let the crisis tendencies in Ukraine and also the work of potential collaborators to have more impact. For certain reason, Putin uh, decided to start the invasion earlier. Um, but, the bad, but, but the bad of the invasion was actually that the Ukrainian state would collapse sooner than it, it, it which, which didn't happen in the reality. Um, yeah, that, so you got us up to early 2022 and I wanted to ask you about that because I found early 2022 to be a very disturbing and strange period. I mean, not only was I really like truly shocked when the full ground scale invasion came, I'd been in, um, Ukraine in most of the summer of 2021. And so the, of course the invasion was shocking and horrifying, but I found the months beforehand very disorienting. So you, of course, know this very well, but for people that don't remember, in late 2021, the U.S. government starts to say quietly, but then very loudly, Russia might invade, Russia's going to invade. Um, and a lot of people respond with skepticism, including not just like the Western left, uh, but Ukrainians, uh, the parts of the Ukrainian government. Uh, and then Russia, of course, invades. Of course, we know um, the sort of horrors that have been unleashed uh, ever since then. But immediately afterwards, there seemed to be a, a very quick sort of line drawn in the sand, at least, you know, in the English speaking uh, Western world where, OK, the U.S. government said that this was going to happen. And now they're backing um, Ukraine. Um, the Biden position, the Biden administration's position on Ukraine is the pro Ukraine position. That's the same thing. Um, and I want to read this footnote that you that I found really interesting in, in, in your book, because you suggest that that sort of that dividing line, that binary is 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 it can be challenged. Um, let me just read this first. In all of the self congratulatory reports, so you're referring to the people that said, I said the invasion was going to happen, then it did. In all of the self congratulatory reports of the US and British elites, I have seen no convincing explanation as to why so little was done to prevent the invasion by those who claimed its imminence several months before it began neither supplying arms to Ukraine much earlier, nor negotiating seriously with Putin. There was practically nothing but an information campaign. Its aim was not to prevent the invasion, but to ensure Western consolidation against Russia after it had begun. Um, I wonder if you could explain the idea of that aim, that the aim was to not to present the invasion, but to um, ensure Western consolidation, and what you think the West, the United States, NATO, could have done, should have done differently uh, in those months. Well, uh, I, I, I still don't have a, an answer to this question. I don't know if, if, if you have. So it was many months as they say, and the invasion is imminent. Many people believed, many people didn't believe in that. That was out of the, what they could imagine. I didn't believe in that. I, I thought that uh, the, not the full scale invasion, but uh, the, uh, Perhaps the, the limited uh, escalation in Donbass was probably possible, uh, but not on, on that scale. Okay, then we are, uh, know that the, uh, well, they were seeing the military concentration of Russian troops on the borders. Um, and they do what? They, for several months, uh, there is this inside comments from the anonymous officials, anonymous intelligence uh, sources, and so on and so forth. And this prepares kind of like background, a very specific response to what is going to happen when Russia invades. So yeah, you were right about that. And, and, and this uh, 
did have an impact on, uh, for example, how the European elites responded in the first days of the after the invasion. The uh, actually the uh, to the extent we also know the, the, there were more skepticism in the EU that this is going to happen than in the US. But uh, they uh, they didn't start to supply the arms, the weapons, uh, at least not to that uh, extent that could uh, make it impossible. Right, so they started to supply the arms quite uh, late before, just uh, a month or so uh, b before they invaded, and this was mainly anti-tank weapons, javelins in particular. Um, they also didn't try to uh, substanti substantially negotiate with Putin. And uh, now they claim that it, it, it would not be possible to negotiate, that he demanded too much, that he didn't even uh, intend uh, to negotiate it, and that he made an ultimatum not to negotiate, but simply to have some pretext and, and so on and so forth. But they didn't do, 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 do a most substantive negotiation before that. They didn't help with the um, implementation of the Minsk Accords. Well, there is some evidence that at least parts of the Western elite were not even interested in the implementation of the Minsk Accords. And so, um, and then uh, invasion starts, right? And then what I was thinking about uh, that, uh, that uh, it would be necessary to support Ukrainian resistance, also with the weapons, to stop the uh, to, to, to stop Russia. But at the same time, uh, you need to uh, try to sol to to look for the diplomatic solution about that. And uh, now we know that there were Istanbul negotiations, and that we, we also know that they proceeded quite far. And we also know that uh, they did not acquire uh, the support from the West uh, that could make them possible. Hmm. Some say that uh, this happened because, uh, well, nobody in the West would give Ukraine those guarantees that uh, would be required to. Others say that actually the West was not really interested about that and that they did not ma uh, make uh, enough efforts to try this way. Mm. And then if, if what was happening was actually insufficient efforts, you start to raise the questions about the interest of those people, at least in, 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 among uh, a section of the Western elites. Were they interested to use the opportunity for, for the, of the war provided that Russians started, but then you did not make enough efforts neither to prevent nor to stop soon enough in order to pursue certain interests of, uh, of, of those uh, elites in the West. By which interests? Well, one, one of the common explanation is the weakening Russia. And it okay. does uh, seem that, uh, at least initially, especially when the Russian uh, original invasion plan uh, so spectacularly failed, right, they could have uh, expectations that they need just to send a little bit more weapons to Ukraine, uh, they need to impose sanctions on Russia and uh, in a um, quite short term, time, uh, Russia would be defeated. It's At least it seemed like uh, some common um, uh, viewpoint or expectations again, at least among some groups of the, of the Western elites. Perhaps there were more skeptical people or more realistic people and there were more like sober analysis even from the very start of the war but well to, uh, to which extent they, they had an influence on the decision makers and perhaps well, well the people like boris johnson they could really believe that for example that uh, it would be possible to defeat russia uh, in a short time and with uh, relatively 
uh, small casualties that would, of course, disproportionately uh, lie on the Ukrainian people that the, they do not really care about. The question that I often pose, and you can tell me if this is a uh, uh, the wrong way to pose it. The, the question I often pose is is about 2014 to 2022. A lot of Ukrainians, not a super majority of Ukrainians, but a lot of Ukrainians starting in 2013 and 2014 fought to turn to the West, said to the West, we want to join you. We're willing to fight and die. We're willing to cause problems for your geopolitical enemy, uh, Russia, in order to sort of be more integrated into the group of most powerful nations in human history. The West obviously loved this. The United States government did not hide that it was very enthusiastic about um, Ukrainians doing this. Um, this was something that, um, you know, at, certainly at the, at the level of public support was very obvious. Why was it not the case then afterwards that the most the richest and most powerful countries in human history did not provide Ukrainians with material benefits or s real security? Why was it why is it the case that the the richest countries in, in the world could not do anything to really bring Ukraine into the West in the way that sort of, you know, perhaps now looks back, you look back on it and th these claims might seem naive, but the the, the desire to try to to have the kind of a life that seemed possible just a little bit. So the West, it was certainly within, I think, the material <laughs> capacity of the United States and NATO to do something, to sort of, you know, in crude geopolitical terms, pay back a certain part of Ukrainian society or pay back Ukraine for um, this very spectacular turn to the West from 2013 and 2014. Why was it that, you know, what actually did happen from 2014 to 2022 and why wasn't it the West helping to make Ukrainians richer and safer, um, whether or not, uh, you know, including from from foreign invasion. That's the way that I always ask this. When, when presented with the idea that Biden's response in 2022 is the most pro-Ukrainian position possible, I ask, why is it that the most powerful nation on earth did not do something uh, to respond true to the aspirations that were put forward by so many people uh, and that were clearly so that clearly so excited many um, actors in the U.S. government in 2013 and 2014. Well, I think that the, the answer to this question starts not in 2013, even, but may, perhaps in the early 1990s with the way how the post-Soviet uh, transition started and in uh, difference with the Central Eastern Europe, uh, where the, again, Revolutions of 1989 happened, and where the block of uh, uh, dissident intelligentsia acquired more power, and uh, also the uh, local oligarchs did not emerge to that extent as uh, in the post-Soviet countries, which also uh, opened them to the foreign capital, Western capital, and one of the uh, um, most convincing explanation, I think, is offered by Peter Gowan, the left wing political scientist or IR professor, um, uh, where, when he uh, says that if uh, in the 1990s the Russian oil and gas would be allowed to be appropriated by the Western companies, uh, Russia would be first in NATO before Poland, before Czech Republic, before Eastern Germany. That would be the Russia first policy because they would they would need uh, the political superstructure and military superstructure over the uh, <clears throat> property of the transnational companies. And so that, that question about political capitalists, uh, which class precisely acquired the dominant positions in the post-Soviet economies, also Ukraine, uh, I think uh, it has a lot to do to explain uh, that, uh, on the one hand, uh, lack of proper integration of the countries like Ukraine into the Euro-Atlantic institutions, which like theoretically could have started earlier. Right. I mean, but this they is. Were, but they, 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 were, they were also interested not simply in 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 bringing the people like Yanukovych into EU and NATO but actually acquiring the uh, real control over the 
economy and politics of the post-Soviet societies. And the, the, the word corruption has a lot to do about uh, who actually has uh, control over, over, over our countries, the local elites or the supposedly honest and anti-corrupt uh, Western capital. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, um, anti-corruption as a, a very popular type of crusade in the last 20 years and one that, have thir- you know, it is not neutral. It, 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 whether the corruption is real, whether the corruption is imagined, anti-corruption must be done in a certain way and it and it there are certain winners uh in south america this is a huge discussion over the last 10 years well, what who benefits from a particular type of anti-corruption crusade against whom um that again one more, one more way in which ukraine's recent history um i think is echoed through a lot of the rest of the world outside of you know outside of the uh outside of the north atlantic you don't get sort of anti-corrupt well italy being the example but in general anti-corruption as a as a as a well orchestrated crusade tends to happen outside of the first world and so so just just to finish Please. that the that uh, euro atlantic integration for the post soviet space was never simply about uh, well geopolitical orientation it also it has also political economic dimension and corruption and anti corruption had uh, was a part was a part of that it, it was also about the transformation of the elite of those countries transformation of the actual ruling class. Um, and uh, in the end, uh, the uh, how, how that Euro-Atlantic promises for Ukraine worked was as an instrument to uh, not allow the consolidation of a sovereign center of capital accumulation to emerge in the post-Soviet space, space mm-hmm. which could be, which was actually Putin's project, mm-hmm. to re-establish the uh, uh, kind of like a sovereign control over that collapsed and disintegrated area under Russian leadership. But also the leadership that would uh, be not uh, in uh, subservient relations with the West, at least in, in the minds of the of the elite, and that was the heart of the problem. Mm. That uh, well, they could have this carrot uh, in front of Ukraine. That eventually Ukraine will become the member of NATO, as Bukharest summit claimed, and offering EU association agreement as potentially in some distant future uh, a, a roadmap to, 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 to join the European Union. B- but at the same time, not going into that direction. Mm. So that offer was, was primarily to mm. uh, kind of like to, 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 to set a barrier on the a uh, Russian way to consolidate those huge space, mm. but not exactly to integrate uh, <clears throat> the post-Soviet countries in, into the uh, Euro-Atlantic institutions uh, and to offer the people of Ukraine the benefits that many of them actually expired for. Um, I want to make a talk about a comparison to a different country, because a lot of what we've been talking about is the way that Ukraine has echoes elsewhere or can be compared to other um, historical or contemporary situations. Um, In March 2022, Hillary Clinton compared Ukraine favorably, it seemed, to Afghanistan uh, in the 1980s. Um, She said soon after the full-scale Russian invasion that, well, the Russians, she said the Russians, but the Soviet Union uh, entered Afghanistan and we supported the, the resistance. We supported the, the people that were required to bleed them um, and to ultimately defeat them. And as we know, there are a, a lot of um, prominent members of the U.S. foreign policy establishment that call that a big victory um, in the Cold War uh, because of the way that it weakened the Soviet Union. So back in, Mar- back in March, Hillary takes the analogy that far. She says, well, that went really poorly for the Russians. Um, and that's, uh, I think she says, the model people are now looking at for fighting this war in Ukraine to support the resistance um, that is required to make this inv- invasion a big 
a big headache for a geopolitical rival to weaken them. And then, of course, what what is left out of that picture was what happens after the Soviet Union leaves Afghanistan. Who has been empowered? What is the situation in the society um, with these armed uh, groups that, you know, uh, you know, you can fast forward throughout the 90s to to the early 20th century. And the question of what happened in Afghanistan is one that is still with us. Um, but then I was really f- surprised last was it last month um, in Chicago. So I attended the, the the panel that you did with Elena Lubchenko and Taras Bilus. Um, you all won the Daniel Singer Prize for for um, various uh, articles on contemporary Ukraine. And for those that may not remember from early 2022, Taras Bilus, who's now fighting um, the war, was very critical of certain uh, parts of the Western left for the way that it had approached um, the Russian invasion that year. It was interesting, well, we can set this aside, it was interesting that he says that he now thinks about that differently and that he says that he knows what he's fighting against, but it's harder for him to, to, to articulate what he's fighting for. But what I want to get to is that he also brought up Afghanistan. And he said that the, Ukraine, the Afghanistan outcome is a possibility for Ukraine. Um, that there is the possibility of a kind of a, 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 a an ongoing insurgency. And, and he said in that case, the far right wouldn't be an important element. They would be the leaders of that um, scenario, that the far right in this Afghanistan scenario that he imagines, um, the far right would be at the, f- the front of a, a long term um, insurrection. Do you think that there is an, a way to compare what's going on right now? in Ukraine to Afghanistan? Do you think this comparison makes any sense in either of these two directions? Um, And and if not, what would be a a comparison you would make? Well, I'm I'm not sure about uh, such direct comparison to Afghanistan because Afghanistan, well, to to have this kind of uh, prolonged, decades long guerrilla war against the occupying power, you also need a certain structure of the society. And it works better in the agrarian societies and uh, like Afghanistan. It doesn't work that well uh, in the modernized, urbanized societies post-Soviet Ukraine. That's uh, well, we were speaking about Basinger. That's actually also one of parts of their uh, his argument. The revolution changes precisely because of urbanization, and that's also because they become more about uh, mobilization of the people on the streets and not uh, leading an armed insurrection, even against the occupying power. Uh, so if you if you imagine uh, one, well, well, <laughs> we could actually see uh, that uh, it is not exactly Afghanistan that happens in the uh, occupied southeastern Ukraine occupied by Russians. There is some resistance, there is some violent resistance, but uh, not to the extent of like uh, what was happening in in Afghanistan with massive uh, first anti-Soviet and then anti-American movement led by Talibs. Uh, uh, We've seen that uh, this violence, this repression is quite, 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 quite serious coercion, Russians were capable to consolidate the control over the occupied territories. And the people rather leave than stay there and uh, continue fight uh, against against Russians. Um, The Russians actually, they, uh, they are interested in changing the ethnic composition of those territories and uh, which would ensure the uh, more loyal population and that would uh, could ensure the continuous control over, the, over those territories. Something that also, it's, to the extent I know, that didn't happen in Afghanistan, mm-hmm. neither under Soviets nor under, nor under uh, US-aligned government. Um, so the, the, the differences are big and uh, the, the difference are of some fundamental social structural roots. Uh, in, in the sense that the country, uh, Ukraine, is used against Russia, well, it is used 
just uh, I don't know how, how blind one one can be you know, not to see that uh, the interests of Ukrainians are not exactly aligned with the interests of the Western elites. Um, and we've already discussed the, the that possibility of a negotiated solution that uh, could have been pushed further, but this could have been tried to, and uh, and how many lives have been lost between spring 2022 and well we are now speaking in autumn 2024. Um, and how much of destruction Ukraine uh, survived in this period. Um, well, so also speaking about Afghanistan, uh, this is uh, the country with a very different demographic structure. Uh, much bigger, younger people who can join the armed groups, who could, who could fight, uh, much higher birth rate and so on and so forth. Ukraine is now it's like a demographic, a demographic catastrophe of extraordinary scale. You're just thinking about the millions who left Ukraine, and these are mostly the fertile women uh, who might not get, go back to Ukraine. And so that means that uh, basically the, 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 the population would not be reproduced. Uh, the most recent United Nations forecast for Ukraine is that uh, Ukrainian population is going down to 15 million by the end of the century. In 1992, Ukraine had 52 million. So that would mean the loss of 70% of the peak population in the country. That would be the country which is like two or three times less than it is now. And so uh, in, in, in this case of this downward demography, um, that puts uh, yeah puts obstacles not only for the long term guerrilla war, but also to any prospects of economic reconstruction. You would you would basically need to invite uh, more people to sustain the, uh, the so the young fertile women are leaving, but who who stays in Ukraine males, but also mainly the older population who needs to be sustained, their pensions needs to be paid and because they, they are not capable to work anymore. Um, and so uh, that's, uh, well, in, in the sense of some, some metaphor, Afghanistan is a complete uh, disaster. Well, U Ukraine is a disaster. In the sense of, uh, of some prolonged guerrilla war, I'm not so sure. What about in the sense of if there were a resolution which is unacceptable to a radical minority, that they, they would continue fighting in some way, um, you know, certainly not at the scale of, of, of uh, the, the entirety of Afghanistan. Um, the possibility that if there had been a resolution or if there were a resolution that ended the current war in ways in with lines or outcomes that were unacceptable to that were not acceptable to every Ukrainian. I mean, I think it's very hard to imagine an outcome that is acceptable to any every Ukrainian. Um, could there be some people that continue to to, to fight the war? Or you think that is not not so likely? Well, uh, there have been many examples. One, for, one, for example, the compromise negotiations were not accepted by the uh, radical minority, and they continued the fight. Uh, well, I think Ireland, in particular, in the like 100 years ago, it's one of the cases. Um, but it, uh, well, at the same time, it's uh, I, I'm among the people who are not downplaying the impact of the far right. But at the same time, it's also it should not become kind of like an excuse. Right? So it, 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 it's been quite a, quite a funny story in the in the discussion about Ukraine and when uh, the the people like. Spent a lot of like hours uh, in, in uh, explaining that those far right are not uh, popular. They are almost irrelevant, and uh, we shouldn't pay uh, so much attention to them as uh, uh, so many alarmist media discussing them because it's just a juicy story with all these uh, Nazi symbols and, and and tough guys with weapons. Uh, but at the same time, when when the question of negotiations comes to uh, to, to, to the agenda. Well, almost the same people are 
uh, starting to recall, oh, there is a radical minority in Ukraine, they would not allow this, so the, the, the negotiations is, is so difficult. Of course, negotiations are difficult, but and the far right is a problem, but it, it is not an, an unsolvable problem, right? So the, 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 that's, that's a typical situation, and we need to think about the, the solutions to that, how to pacify that uh, that minorities that might not accept uh, the the compromise uh, solution, uh, what to do with them, and uh, what, what should uh, what should be done in order to make the peaceful solution more, more stable, uh, and and but this is not an argument uh, to, to 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 continue the suicidal war. Understanding the economic and demographic impact for for, for Ukraine. And also, well, also understanding possible uh, catastrophic escalations in 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 the form of nu- nuclear war between between Russia and NATO. Okay. No, yeah, that's uh, you've already said it, but that's no, that's quite a striking way to put it. Is that precisely the people that were to, would might say I mean, these people don't exist? Will also have, have have said, oh well, we have, you know they won't accept it, so we have to. Um, push for something that that, we, that cannot be achieved. Um, I want to end then with the beginning of your book because your book um, is mostly chronological. It mostly goes um, in the order that it is written. It starts with Maidan and goes through the beginning of the Russian invasion, but it opens this with this essay or preface uh, about being a wrong Ukrainian about the feeling or analysis that. Ukraine is no longer the, a, a certain is no country for certain types of men. Let's say is no longer the country that is can be home to every type of person that it was before, or or cannot be home to every type of person that you, you wish it could be home for. Uh, in one part of the essay, you say those of us who thought a certain way, and I want you to ask how you what kind type of thinking this was. Those of us who were who thought a certain way didn't even need to be attacked head on we we simply we were simply not allowed to exist quote um and another part of the essay you said in ukraine we can't be soviet anymore period in russia it does not look like we can be ukrainian um what type of ukrainian is 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 the wrong ukrainian for the post maidan or the post 2022 um political order and why and and can that be changed can that can that idea of a Ukraine for, that is a home for everyone that you would like it to be be, be reclaimed? Well, I could have been talking about this for, for, for perhaps for the same uh, time that we've already talked in the interview. Uh, well, the, 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 this wrong Ukrainian scene is obviously ironic. It's kind of like it emerges in the, in the in these discussions when 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 I say this uh, uh, based on my research as a social scientist, also based on my uh, political convictions as a person who comes from the left of Ukrainian society and Ukrainian politics, uh, that comes also from uh, from some some specific. Uh, personal background and family background of those Ukrainians, Soviet Ukrainians, who <clears throat> uh, who experienced uh, the um, rapid modernization in the Soviet in the Soviet period, who experienced social progress, who experienced advancement. And my family was not connected to the party nomenclature. We were not in the elite. Uh, my parents kind of like became intellectual elite. But also coming from the from the family backgrounds of workers and peasants, um, and then they, uh, my my father started to work in uh, cosmonautics after graduating from the one of the most prestigious uh, uh, universities in in the Soviet Union, Moscow Polit- Institute of Physics and Technology, kind of like Soviet MIT. Um, and working in the institution, which uh, could have, uh, which actually created one, uh, the, the, the first uh, personal computer in the Soviet Union, and, and uh, then might have been creating something like Soviet internet. So 
that experience of social and technological advancements, it's part of my family, right? And then uh, how, how the uh, discussion about Ukraine were framed after the full-scale inv full invasion and to which extent they could in incorporate the, the, this uh, story, this experience and uh, this negative and this analysis. And so uh, and uh, when I was trying to voice them, well, the extent of uh, attacks and hate I've been uh, I've acquired in social media, but also from from the people who could actually make those uh, threats uh, reality, and they have a record of violent attacks on the left. Uh, and so, uh, uh, when when those discussions basically develop in in the way of uh, of denying me an, a Ukrainian identity because I'm speaking something different. And so I cannot be a Ukrainian because everyone, every Ukrainian, those Western people know they speak something else. And but they communicate with a very specific group of Ukrainians who are actually uh, the, you know, sometimes they actually no professionally how to speak with the Westerners. So uh, that's uh, that's obviously ironic. And when, when we, again when we think about the now, nowadays reality of a dispersed nation, like several millions. Uh, in Crimea, in Donbass, occupied territories, uh, millions in uh, as refugees or even previously migrant workers in Russia, even more millions in, in the European Union. Uh, the people who simply think differently and stay in Ukraine, who would leave Ukraine if they would be allowed to, but they cannot because they are males between 18 and 60 and they are on the military duty and they cannot leave. Um, what, what they think? And it's not, it's not a claim that uh, I'm speaking for some imagined majority of Ukrainians, uh, but it's uh, rather a claim that so that that um, that that imagined majority is actually not not the real majority. We, we, we are we, we are we are very different, and mm. we, we we voice very different uh, interests, ideas now, very different narratives, and this is experience of this. Um, Escalation of the crisis, perhaps to the ultimate point, so the total fragmentation of the political community. At the moment when we uh, need to start again to think about uh, some what we can do in the midst of in the midst of this disaster, what we what we can do with our country, uh, how we can speak uh, when we appeared in divided by the front lines, uh, divided by the borders. How to speak about the common interest about that, and that, that that's the experience of optimization, fragmentation. Uh, the the experience when, uh, well, on my personal level, I feel like I don't have a homeland anymore. Right, and potentially yes, we can think about some different project of Ukraine, but the projects that were dear to me, they they were defeated. They they were not realized to the extent they could potentially be realized also in part because we were uh, insufficiently organized, insufficiently politically articulated, insufficiently maybe doing something but that we could do more. Uh, that didn't happen. And uh, uh, now in the... Um, in the, in the situation of this uh, escalating crisis that uh, should be described as no less as a, as a suicidal disaster, um, we need to, well, we might start to think about how to, how to move out from this. And uh, we also understand how the, the uh, developments, at least certain developments in Ukraine or in larger post-Soviet space, actually, the Miro some of the uh, global trends. We've been speaking about the crisis of hegemony, we've been speaking about crisis of representation, about the that uh, very general dynamics of uh, the contemporary revolts and uh, protest campaigns, revolutions uh, that do not lead to the to the to the implementation of the people's aspirations, but instead we are in the uh, escalating crisis. And, uh, well, Ukraine serves as an example how far it may go, how bad it may go, and uh, with how 
disastrous consequences it may end. And well, it may be not the very end because again, we are, once again, we are thinking about a real possibility of a nuclear war. So even worse things may happen. And uh, that's that's uh, that's not an answer. Well, well, in the left, we are we are always we are always thinking about some some kind of cheerleading ending, something to inspire the people, inspire for the struggle, and so on and so forth. Well, this is this is the ending that um, perhaps may may show the extent of the um, our unintended consequences of what we are doing. Or what we could have done in order to prevent those developments uh, may sound very pessimistic, may sound uh, very gloomy, uh, but that's how it is. Well, it sounds it sounds very honest. Um, and well, with that, Vladimir, thank you very much for for taking the time to talk through all of this, and thank you for this book, which. I think really does allow us to think very hard about what has happened, not only in the post-Soviet space, but what's what's happening um, in the global system as it confronts quite a few um, varied but often overlapping crises. So um, I, I think I will return to it to try to read this book, that is to rethink what it is that is actually going on when it ha what has happened to us but for now i'll just say once more thank you very much thank you vincent <laughs>